Uh, start off with Romans 3. That will be the best place. Start off with Romans 3 before I forget that one, too. <laughs> Romans chapter 3. It's a standard verse that you and I know. Romans 3, 23. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Romans 3, then we'll look at verse 23. Now, I'll do the best that I can here. First of all, we all agree why we are not perfect. We're not perfect because everyone sinned. Amen. That's right, brother. So we all sin. Now, remember, when people say that they're not a sinner, when you look at that verse, the verse says, for all have sinned, but there's a reason there. The reason is, for all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. Now, that's very important. That's very important. I want you to remember that. What defines sin here? You fall short of God's perfection. Now, already, this is going to open up Pandora's box. You ready? Get ready to be blown away, if it will, okay? Are you perfect like God? No, no we're not. Is God's job to perfect us? Listen, if it's, job, if it's his job to perfect us, realize this. While we're going through a perfection process, we assume, get this, we assume that he's just trying to make us better, but we don't think about sin in the picture. Now, did anyone get lost or you get it so far? Let me say this. Repeating again, what is sin? We fall short of God's perfection. Yes. We're not perfect like God, correct? Right. That's correct? Is it his job to perfect us while, when we're saved and to help us yes. spiritually grow in the Lord? When he's perfecting us, it's his job during that perfection cleaning off sins yes. that we don't think to be sins. I told you, that already blown you away, right? This is what I even dare say. Listen, when the martyr is going through his test from the Lord, being tortured and then family being uh, persecuted, wife, children, and then he has to get burned at the stake, the Lord is obviously testing his faith, perfecting him, correct? But that martyr, I would even dare say this, the Lord is cleaning off impurities, or even, I would dare say, sins from his flesh. Okay? So, I'm not saying the martyr is getting tortured for Christ because he's getting punished for his sin. No, far be it from that. It's because the Lord's perfecting him, cleaning his sins. Now, before I get into that, okay, that does sound very unfair. So, that's why this is going to be a very deep teaching here. Now, you notice right here, unfairness, correct? Unfairness. This is all what we're focusing on, but we don't know within our heart process, our thought process, our spiritual process. We don't have the mind of God, but God sees all of this. There are so many steps behind this before you conclude God is unfair or you conclude anything's unfair with your life. Okay? And these are the consequences that come out from unfairness. Now, notice from unfairness, it's what? Reality. Did you notice that there? If we exclude God from the picture, it doesn't change the fact we live in a world of unfairness. Correct. Correct. Okay? Now, evolutionist atheists, they think that if you get rid of God from the picture, because the reason why they're against God I would dare say, is not because of science or lack of evidence, it's because of suffering. Right. You'll notice a lot of times it's something emotional to them, which is why they don't want to believe in God. So it has to do with this unfairness thing here. They assume by escaping the reality, uh, well, basically, if they escape God because of suffering, they get the answer. But that's, not, but that's even worse. Then they fall whim to the, the randomness of nature and whatever unfortunate event or tragedy they go through without any explanation. 
That's a horrible way to live. You know why? Because they don't, uh, they just, uh, if you put God, there's just too much in here of an explanation going on and they just don't understand. So just leave it to randomness. But when you leave it to randomness, then uh, that's pretty hard. Then there's no one to blame. You can't blame God. And uh, you have to take uh, accountability for your actions and stuff like that. Now, to be quite honest, that's what Christians should be doing as well. We shouldn't be blaming events or other people or anything, and we should take accountability of our own actions. Uh, but the problem is, is that because we're Christians, we have God in the picture, it's easy to blame events, blame God, or not take accountability for our actions because we're just good, godly, sincere people. Now, let me say that because the reason why this is so important is I'm going to prove to everybody that you're just dirty, rotten sinners, no matter how good of a person you are. Period. Period. Now, that sounds unfair, right? So let's start out this way, okay? Now, we originally lived in perfection, correct? All right. Now, there are three ways to argue against this with the atheist. The atheist says, if God is all loving, why did he allow suffering to happen? Well, it's because of our sin. Well, then why didn't he prevent the knowledge of good and evil from being there, right? Why did he have to, why couldn't he just punish Adam and Eve simply? Why did he have to punish everybody? Blah, 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 blah. The argument keeps on going, all right? Now, there are three easy arguments against this, okay? One easy argument is it didn't have to be Adam and Eve. It could be you. <laughs> so you're telling me in a perfect world, perfect life, you get everything perfect, no sin, all right? That you will never sin at all. All right, that's easy argument number one. Easy argument number two, in the millennium, God's going to prove it again. Gives them perfect world, perfect environment, no, no one to blame, no one nothing, and they still choose sin. Now, let me give you easy argument number three, which you want to probably write down, all right, before you blame God, okay? Easy argument number three, even without, the, even without Adam's fall, even without the millennium's fall, think about things in your current life that were perfect, but you still sinned. You know what my point is? My point is God can make anything perfect for you. You're still going to sin. Did that make any sense? If God got rid of suffering, if God put perfect environment, if God um, gave you perfect physical condition, mental, emotional condition to endure the temptation suffering or to overcome, if he gave you medicine or anything, my point is you still sin because there are literally dozens in your life, if not hundreds, where you had everything perfect, but you still chose sin, didn't you? That's the most convincing evidence that you can't blame God. Because if you say, well, God, if you make this perfect, that perfect, don't change the fact, you, you're still going to sin. Okay? Well, that's because of my flesh. That's why I sin. No, even if you, your flesh didn't feel like sinning, you still choose to sin, don't you? Like I told you before, there's literally dozens, if not hundreds of times in your life, you had every perfect condition and there was no one to blame except you if you sinned that day. Yes. All right, is that convincing enough? All right, then get off the blaming God part. Yes. Amen. Get off the blaming God part. Now, once we choose sin, here's what we don't think about here, okay? When we choose sin, what happens when you choose sin? Does, it, does sin play fair or it's unfair? Okay, unfair. If it's unfair, this is what happens, okay? So this is step one. God originally made everything perfect, so you can't blame God. He, gave, he made everything perfect, but we chose sin, and don't say Adam and Eve, we, okay? We chose sin, so we get off of this step, so we get into this step here. Now, in this step, sin puts within what we hate the most, probably more than the devil, is our flesh, right? It's our fleshly nature. We hate this thing so much. Yes. The consequence of sin is that sin is in you. So birth. All right? So you are born to sin. What's the point here? The point is no matter how good you live your life or how hard you work, 
get this, you're still gonna sin. Yes, that's right. Well, no, that, I mean, that's not fair. And what, that, who says sin plays fair? Right? Sin is supposed to be unfair. Yes. And you can't blame God for sin because you already chose it. Yep. Did that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we can agree then that no matter how good you live, you still sin. Amen. Now, not only is sin in us, so it's in our nature, okay? But we got the environment now outside us. So environment can cause us to sin. Whether we see wickedness out there that can tempt us, it causes our flesh to sin. Or when suffering happens, stress factors happens within our environment, it, it hits our flesh where our weaknesses come out very easily. Uh, the environment causes us to sin easily. All right, There could be people out there or factors out there that will teach you to sin. All right, Now, it's easy to blame the environment then. See that? It's easy to blame people for the sins that we commit when we don't mean to do it. But remember this, you chose it. And the sin's consequence is to give that unfairness. Why? Why is that? You have to understand this, okay? This is why this is very important. Let's assume you have perfect conditions in your life. Don't gamble with sin. That's an important, valuable lesson learned. If you have everything perfect in life, don't think that if you commit this sin, it's harmless. No, what it did then, it's going to start its unfairness cycle. All right? Now, uh, let me give an example here, okay? Uh, let's say, well, let's give an example about anger, okay? You yielded into anger over here. Everything was perfect. You can't blame God. You can't blame anybody, but you yielded to that one. Then sin starts its cycle and then gets inside your flesh. What happens is sin's job is unfairness right here. So because it's unfairness, let's say you have an environmental issue with lust. So there's something lustful you see out there. Then it causes you to sin. Here's the thing. <clears throat> we could blame the lustful environment. Well, if the lustful environment was gone, then I wouldn't sin. No, because of that choice you made about anger, it puts something in your hidden nature. And what it's going to do is that unfairness happens. So lust, you got to realize, didn't just come from nowhere. Lust came from somebody out there, from something out there, from all the way out there where you can trace back all the way to the original sin. What's my point? My point is sin, you're not going to connect what you originally sinned with the thing that you're currently struggling in your environment, that type of sin. You're not going to connect the dots. Sin is so unpredictable, it's so unfair, it's so confusing that you're not going to trace it back. It's not like, hey, I commit the sin of anger, so I receive the uh, fairness of, uh, if I commit that sin of anger, then I need to calm down and I need to avoid anger factors. No, that's not how it works. You commit the sin of anger, then it exposes to another sin out there that you can get involved with. It's, it's a very complex cycle, sin. Why? Because you give it time and people talk, see, do things every second. And you got billions in our world. What that caused is a mess of confusion that all connects to original sin here. Did that make any sense or was that over our heads? Okay. All right. What's my point? My point is that's how dangerous sin is. So one lesson learned is this. One lesson learned is, listen, just because you fix your environment doesn't mean you're not going to sin. You ever wondered why? Why do I still sin and mess up when I fix my environment, when I work so hard, when I stayed away from sinful things in my environment? Because sin is unfair, deep, complex. All right? If that made any sense here. So there's environment, weakness is a big one. So I mentioned about stress factor from environment. That can connect to weakness. Let's say um, that your flesh, it has, um, you know, the LGBTQ+, they insist that they were born that way, right? 
because something in their pineal gland or pituitary gland or whatever gland in their brain, they're going to find a body part. I guarantee you. It doesn't matter. They're going to find some body part or organ in there that produces chemicals in a more different way that makes it more sexually attractive to some kind of gay gene or whatever. They're going to do that, all right? You got tons of stuff in your body, you can find one gay gene somewhere to prove your point, all right? So that's not a good argument. But anyway, the point is, is that the point is, is that the weakness of the flesh that the LGBTQ struggle with, they insist being born this way, right? And we argue, no, it's not born this way. It's a choice you made, right? But think about them and drug addicts. We do know, and liberals will agree, for drug addicts, it's, not, uh, it's because of the choices that they made that they ended up like this, so they need to be free from that. But it's the same thing with any sin, such as LGBTQ+. So with these sins, why do they think that they're born this way? It's because in their flesh, they discover that their flesh is more prone to those sins. And actually, that is very true. But that doesn't mean you're born that way and you're doomed and you don't take responsibility. Right? No, every drug addict has to still take responsibility, no matter what even if their brain or their body is more prone to do the uh, sinful behavior, it doesn't change the fact we're still all held accountable. Now, we say that's unfair, but that's sin's job. It's to be unfair, okay? So we got weaknesses in our flesh. The weaknesses in our flesh are, are, is another outward thing that happens. And when these weaknesses hit our flesh, and it's trying our patience, it's trying our spiritual state, and we're trying to stay clean, but we can't just help it, and we yield into sin. So then what happens? The easy thing to do is to blame, see that? It's to blame how we were born. Blame our health. It is, it's sad, but there are people who had healthy bodies, but then after a serious accident, their body got damaged, and then they've been struggling with some ill behavior or sinful behaviors they didn't struggle with before. That does happen. This is genuine, real stuff that you need to hear because this is reality that we're all going to go through. So then, weaknesses do happen, but that doesn't mean you're free from accountability. See, you're still held responsible for your actions. Well, that sounds unfair, right? What if something bad happened to you right now in your body and then it caused something in your behavior, uh, I've seen uh, grown men who were strong and well-built, but then something bad happened to their bodies and then their estrogen level went really high. And then now they struggled with emotional anger issues that they didn't have before, before, they had, uh, before their health fell apart. That happens, this is real life stuff. I dealt with these kind of people. When that happens then, it's easy to blame our health, our flesh, or even God. God, why did you allow this to happen? Basically, God, why did you cause me to sin? Now, uh, Pastor Andrus and Dr. Upman mentioned this, which is really good. It was really good during their preaching. I'm going to give it to you. Go to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, we all know the famous passage about Paul struggling with his thorn in the flesh, correct? We know about that passage, but you know what Dr. Upman once said? And do you know what Pastor Andrew said? He believes that this thorn in the flesh is not simply just an eye problem for Paul. He actually believed that it was a sinful temptation Paul was struggling with. And the Lord allowed that thorn in the flesh to be inserted in Paul. Now that sounds like, are you kidding me? But I'm telling you what, I, re I remember after he preached that, that got people under conviction. They went on the altar after that. That really blessed them, that helped them. Amen. Because there were people struggling with things in their flesh and their temptation, and they just want to get rid of it. But see, the Lord let that thorn remain. Amen. To keep working on them. Amen. This is powerful stuff. Now, that sounds obviously like really wrong and unfair. 
Because you can think of a ton of verses. God does not cause people to sin. God does not tempt people and stuff like that. So we'll get back to that, okay? But first, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The infirmities uh, were Christ bore it on the cross of Calvary. You remember that? That can be inclusive with sin. See? So in other words, then is Paul saying right here possibly that the Lord allowed Satan to, to tempt him and for that temptation and that sinful struggle to remain so that the Lord can use his life? Yes. Now, the thing is, we're wondering, obviously, well, God doesn't tempt people to sin. Why would God do something like that? That's just evil. Would God deliberately cause people to commit evil? And there's that Calvinist teaching that we fully deny, correct? So here's the thing what you got to realize that a lot of people don't know. The answer is given in this verse and go to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. This verse and 1 Peter 3. So let's start out here. Let's go back to step number one. This is why it's a lot, right? It can get deep, complicated, so I have to be drawn out. Let's go back to step one. We're not even in three and four, all right? So when we go to step one, here's suffering, correct? And that could probably include the temptation that you're struggling with. It's not just trial for your flesh or pain for your flesh, but even temptation for your flesh. Okay, so let's include that. There's a reason why. That's why it's interesting in James chapter 1, a lot of the temptations we go through, the Bible says, uh, temptation is, uh, can be included when the Bible says that he will uh, give us that crown where we endure temptation, the crown of life, where we're able to overcome temptation. That temptation has to do with not just persecution, suffering, but even temptation itself, sin. They're all in that same crown for a reason, okay? They're all in that same crown for a reason. So when we go back here with this suffering, sin brings about suffering, correct? Okay, now we cannot blame God, get this now, if God uses our weakness for his good, we cannot blame him for using our weakness, why? Because it wasn't him that brought about the weakness and suffering, what was it brought from? Sin. From who? Yours truly, you. All right? You brought it. You brought it. If this is brought upon, listen, without, picture without God, then you think these things aren't still going to come out. They're still going to come out. So why does God use it then? Listen, this is a blessing. Why God uses it is that he didn't deliberately try to start up something. It's because he knows it's in you. But what he's trying to do is, even though this comes out of you, he's going to turn it to good. That should show we should never get bitter at God, but more thankful. Thank you, Lord. Now, a lot of people doubt that, okay? So let's, let, let me give some examples here, okay? A lot of people doubt that because, let's be honest, there are things in your life, and the verse says it too, God put the thorn in Paul's flesh. God did that. You see these incidents in your life where God's testing, trying you, and you always think, listen, listen to me, you always think in your mind that if this trial never happened, if this test didn't happen, if this painful thing didn't happen, I would not have done that sin. I would have served God better. Yes. It's easy to blame COVID when we lost a lot of our members, right? Yeah. Yes. It's easy to blame uh, the government or our flesh or drugs or sin or anything out there. It's easy to do that. 
But you have to keep this in mind. If God did not send the trial, then who takes advantage of you? So realize this. This still is in your nature. Do you understand that? If God didn't step in and intervene, he can't clean that nature. So what is his job? Purify, not cause. His job is to purify that weakness, purify uh, the environments that you encounter and what's in your hinder, hidden nature. It's to purify, it's not to cause the weakness. It's not to cause you to sin. It's not to cause. His job is to purify it. Then why does he let these things happen? Because that's sin's job. It's still going to happen. So think about it. Let's say God didn't send these trials in your life. Think about if you didn't change your life after the trial. Draw closer to Jesus. You ever thought about what you can be capable of? You know what a lot of blinded people think? A lot of blinded people think, well, back then, before I got saved, back then, before God sent the trial, I had everything right, I had everything perfect, good life and everything, and because of that, you know, it was much easier, and I wouldn't commit these sins, or, you know, I would be more happy and stuff like that. You know what the problem with that is? That is the brainwashed thinking of every lost sinner who has not been purified and clean, but has grown more into sin. So you want to be like them then? You know what the brainwash thinking is? Is sin's job to give you a perfect environment? Good job, good house, comfortable living, everything good, nothing wrong. We all live happily ever after. Let's all go move to Switzerland after this. That is fantasy la-la land. I don't care how hard mankind's work. The whole earth is dying. What's the point? The point is everyone's living on borrowed time for a perfect environment. That grows out the sin, and what it does, it becomes so destructive, it passes upon the next generation. This is very serious stuff that you need to hear. People become prosperous off of people's, other people's uh, pain. So think, uh, well, well, why is Switzerland so effective? So, I mean, if we just have their government style, their environment and everything, then everything would be all right. No, the reason why that they're better as the way that they are is because everybody else is in pain. But if everyone had a perfect environment like them, competition, war, and no one all, not everyone gets the piece of the pie, and even liberal scientists admit it. Why? Go to third world countries, see people starving to death, and etc. A lot of you don't realize this. When you get your products today, cheap and all stuff like that, it's made in some place where people are working in pain that liberals know. You know what my point is? My point is there's no such thing as good old la-la land where you get everything perfect except you borrow off of someone's pain and hard work. So that's what people are trying to do. See, they're trying to run away from pain and then try to get in a perfect place, but that's borrowed time. Then they'll run to another place, then to another place, another place, and then... Yeah, that's good. And then even if you have a perfect life, what about your kids? You want them to live more pain than you do? A lot of parents don't understand this. Listen, a lot of parents don't understand this. When they've constantly ran away from pain, what they've done now is leave their kids in debt to pay off the problems of society now. You're all living on borrowed time. Look at San Francisco, beautiful place, wonderful place. We all live happily ever after. Now it's a place everybody wants to run away from. Why? It was on borrowed time, especially when you leave sin running. So what would solve the problem? Use your head. If you purified the sin first. But no, we don't want to purify it. It's too much work. Think about it. How do you get a good church environment like this? Yeah. Oh, we live hunky-dory, happy, happily ever after. The Lord gave it to us. Thank you, Jesus, and stuff like that. No, you got to realize this. It costed pain. 
purifying sin and a lot of things to get our good church environment today. What is that? That is trying to purify. Now, no one's going to like this message after this, but it will be the most life-changing, helpful thing ever. It's going to heal a lot of what you're going to see here about bitterness, pain, hurt, anger, tears, blaming, and unfairness and everything. <laughs> this is very important teaching here that you need to hear. Yeah. Think about your, forget church environment, forget society environment. Now think about your individual environment. It's more about you you have to think about. People think they can maintain it through fleshly means. But sin affected all of physical, fleshly, contaminated everything. You're just going by borrowed time again. The best thing is what? You get God to purify it. Now, when he purifies this, remember, he's not causing it. Why is he not causing it? Because this is brought about by sin. This is brought about by sin. So when sin gives birth to all of this, what he'll do is that he'll get it out through suffering. He'll use it through suffering. And then he can purify it. If we get rid of God, then we're let prey to the devil, right? So here's one thing people don't understand. There are two powers going on in this world. We're not left alone to what we want to do. A lot of times we think that way. You think that you work hard, you get a job, family, everybody lives happily ever after the end. No, there are two spiritual powers going on here. There's, there's devil, there's Satan himself, and God. These two powers are working behind the things with every free choice decision that mankind has made. Satan, what he's going to do with the free choices that you make, if they're wrong decisions, see, then he's going to bring more temptation and hope that you fall. He's going to use suffering and other things to make you miserable, make you fall. When one person suffers, what does that breed into? War. You, know what, you want the best example? Here's the best example. And I'm not talking about genocide in Africa. I'm talking about here in America. That's the best example. You got a bunch of minorities whining about, oh, I'm suffering and I'm suffering this and that and that. And that bred into peace or more war, war. anger, violence. See that? Prosper, prosperous America I'm talking here. See, you think you get, you get your perfect environment, we all live happily ever after? La la land. Satan tempts when these factors happen from sin. But God, he can use them to test you and purify you. So here's the point. The point is this. When that thorn in the flesh is given, when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, notice right here that it says, uh, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The what? Messenger of Satan to buffet me. Verse 8, God take it away. But God says in verse 9, I'm using it. I'm using it to make you better. So what's my point? My point is God didn't tempt you. The devil tempted you. God didn't tempt you. God tested you. That's how temptation works or hidden nature and sinful parts work. How it works is when that comes out, if we don't want God in the picture, then who are we left with? Yeah, the devil. You want him to tempt you? Or do you want God to get into the picture and get involved here and put testing? Okay? So, when that's why we can't blame God. If you keep blaming, listen, okay? If you blame God, you know what you're doing? You're chasing him out of this. You know how dangerous that is? Then you're left with this guy. Constantly using your weaknesses or whatever that's in your hidden nature, and he'll, he'll one day use that against you. We all, uh, we all whine about trial and temptations and things uh, in our lives, but it, you got to realize this, is that if you don't get God involved in that one, then this guy will pull it up one day. That's why when we go through suffering, look at this, 1 Peter 3. You think you can escape suffering, but that's not how it works, okay? 
You're going to suffer either way. You're going to go through the sinful parts either way. All right. There's no doubt about it. You're going to go through that. So you got to look at 1 Peter 3, 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that he suffer for what? Well doing. No, I don't want that. Then do you want then for what? Evil doing? Take your pick. You think that these two powers are not going to get involved in your life and you're left to your own device and you can live happily ever after? It doesn't work that way. I mean, you got to realize this. This world's not your own. Your life's not your own. The devil's fighting to reign this over this, take over this place. All right, you think the devil's just going to leave you alone? So you got to realize this. If God doesn't step in and get involved, then this tempter will. And here's another thing. Here's a dangerous thing. Ready for this? A lot of people don't understand this. If God don't purify you now, you know what happens? And the devil makes sure that you live in uh, comfort, pleasantness, as you remain with these sinful things. A lot of people don't understand this. Remember, you're, you're on borrowed time, right? As he keeps making you comfortable, what happens if this hidden nature is not fixed as you keep getting comfortable? You ever thought about that? What happens then is this is not cleaned. It becomes more a part of you. It becomes built into you. As you live in comfort, your body doesn't want to go through adaptive changes. Did that make any sense? I don't know. Okay, yeah. Because like uh, our body is not used to doing new things, right? It's used to doing what it's always thinking, what it's always saying, what it's always behaving, what it's always feeling, right? If these sins are in there as you keep living, talking that way, what you're so used to, what you're so comfortable in, what happens when he tempts you if that's not cleaned off? Anybody want altar call right now? <laughs> like, God, I have a whole bunch right here. <laughs> like, we're all going to be talking like John Wesley after tonight's lesson, you know. <laughs> What's my point? That's why he has to step in. If this guy steps in with your hidden nature, that's dangerous. So God has to keep bringing suffering. Shake it up. Shake it up. Shake it up. So that, there's a, a, so that you can start changing, forcing changes. Now, as you go through changes, we come over here now, all right? Man, we're all getting a blessing, huh? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, when we go through step three, God puts you to changes. Now, this is a lesson on humility, right? All comes down to pride when we go back to Romans 3.23. We're not in God's perfection. But see, we want to remain, listen, we all want our ideal way of living, even if it's spiritual, even if it's spiritual. That can become very dangerous, unconscious pride. Because when you're thinking like that, your own ideal way of living, it's definitely something comfortable to you. It's definitely something that you're used to, that you might enjoy. Those can be fleshly tendencies if you're not careful. All right, now, I'm going back over here, all right? We're all going to hate this lesson after tonight's teaching. But this is all pride then, we have to understand. It's unconscious pride. Unconscious pride. Now, we hate changes. I can't tell you how much I hate changes. Uh, the type of person that I am is I'm very schedule-based. If I have my way, it goes my way. I mean, uh, I'm that type of guy. I'm that type of guy. You don't mess with me, you know. I'm that type of guy. I know that's kind of weird, all right? But I am that way, all right? I actually, I can actually, um, well, no, I'm not going to give this example, okay? I'm just going to ruin my testimony. No, 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 no. That's the devil. That's the devil. That's the devil, okay? That's the devil, all right? All right, but anyway. The, po the point is, is that the Lord sure put me through a fire. Oh, yeah. right. I'm not the type of guy who's 
into changes. I'm organized, I'm built in, I'm this type of guy. Very disciplined in that way, and I'm so used to that, okay? When you rock my world on that one, you rock my world, okay? The Lord rocked my world by putting me in one of the most cultural, diverse, changing areas where people keep changing their gender and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, God, no! All right? My ministry, I had to keep changing. You know that? I had to keep changing. So it was just a mess. All right, so I have to learn to adapt to changes. But anyway, that's all unconscious pride. So what God's doing now, he's breaking it. See that? He's breaking our world. He's going to now see if, if you're in your hidden nature, there is pride. Pride wasn't shown all that time. Why? Pride was hidden. Yes. All right? All these uh, sins were hidden that time. But now after, with, you can choose. If you choose without God testing you, then the devil will tempt you with what you're comfortable and used to. And where you didn't have the sin of pride yet, he'll get it out of you one way or the other. Wow. So this, is, this can come out through Satan tempting you or God testing you. Which one would you prefer? When God tests you, it comes out now. And it comes out in different levels, all right? One, so here's the... Uh, the most obvious part, and then we'll come to the most hard parts, okay? Deliberate, obviously. So God, he'll show you some sins after a trial that he puts you through. And then it might be complaining. Um, it might be bitterness. It might be uh, lying. He'll put some uh, stress factors to test you. Here's an example of a martyr. He's, uh, he's going to deny Jesus Christ. And then they're trying to make him deny Jesus Christ. Well, then he'll have to lie that he ever saw Jesus or he ever believed in Jesus. And then his faith is being tested here. Trial and suffering puts you to the test where you're going to make deliberate choices in your sin. Now, if that was hard enough, it, it gets worse, okay? So that's why we don't like this, all right? We're all used to being what we're used to, what we're comfortable with, okay? We would prefer a camp meeting style preaching about God being good to us. He saved our souls from hell and pretend everything is happily ever after. We would all like that, but that's not reality. And we can't live our lives that way because it's war. It's tragedy, sorrow, suffering, blah, blah, blah. We all go through this. So let me make it worse for you. What happens is then you know that you'll deliberately make a choice to sin sometimes if you choose it. But here's another thing. When God puts a suffering in your life, you might accidentally sin, not deliberately. You might accidentally sin. So um, uh, let's see right here. We got failure, but I don't want to put failure. I want to put maybe fault. I want to put fault. It's kind of in between, so I don't know how to explain this. Maybe I'll just put them together and then you can understand more. All right, what's the difference with accident and fault? Well, I don't really know. There is a difference, though. I, I just don't know how to explain it. But let me give an example like this that anyone can agree with, okay? You drive a car, you're very tired, you're exhausted from work, okay? The stress factors, the suffering that you went through in the workplace just wore you out, okay? You're driving at nighttime, you're so sleepy, you run over a child by accident. All right. So then should we, uh, oh, it's not my fault. It's my boss's fault who overworked me. It's my body's fault because it's more built in to get tired more easily. No, 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 no. In the court, they're going to put the responsibility on you. Right. Now, you're not a child murderer. It's not like you deliberately ran over the child. But in court, they, they have a thing called neglect. And they have a thing where... They recognize accidents do happen, but people still have to pay the price for it. Yes. And this is, get this now, this is without God's involvement. This is speaking strictly from a secular standpoint without God in the picture. That's a tough way to live then, don't you think so? But what if God is in the picture here? What if God is in the picture within that accident? Then you know what we do? We blame God. Wrong. 
If God got involved with the accident, you know what you and I should do? You and I should thank God that he can work it for good to work on our weakness. What do you think that guy's going to do after that car accident? I'll tell you one thing he's going to do. He's going to recognize his weak points. Make sure they don't happen again. Learn from it. He's not going to blame somebody or blame himself or suffer much guilt. And No, no, he's going to get his act together and try to correct things. So guilt is another consequence that could happen if you're not careful, if you don't get a fix. So let me put that up, all right? You know what they're going to do? They're going to work on it that it doesn't happen again. And this is without God in the picture. This is every lost person does this. If every lost person does this, I don't get it. Why can't Christians do that? That's a Christian, to be honest, that's a Christian thing to do. Not to blame God, but to surrender it to God. Yes. Trust him, he can work it for good and work on things where we don't repeat that pattern again. Amen. It's easy. Uh, these are the consequences that are going to happen if you don't choose to fix. The consequences that happen after this accident you committed or a fault that you have because it's your hidden nature, your weakness. You're not diligent enough, maybe. You're not hardworking enough, maybe. Um, you're, not, um, uh, you're not careful. Uh, you take things too lightly, life lightly. Nothing bad's going to happen. See, if you live like that, that's in your hidden nature. And the devil, see, he sees that so he wants to exploit it out of you and get you to mess up. But thank God that he's in the picture. And what he's going to do when the devil tempts you is God uses that to test you so that he can work it out for good to purify it, make you better. Did that make sense Amen. so far? Or is, I don't know if people are lost, but I just I, I, wanna, I want you to understand this, okay? So then we all have something hidden in us that you and I don't know about. Listen to that. There are things in our flesh you and I don't know what we're capable of doing. We don't know. If, uh, I mean, if a random thing happened, all of it, for example, like... Uh, you know, some, some of these movies put stuff like this, but let's say that this room was closed off and then we're all going to die and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you got three seconds to get out the door and save yourself. If you're right there by instinct, you'd probably do that. You wouldn't think about other people and get them out. What, uh, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there's going to come a time in your life where your flesh, we don't know what we're capable of doing. All right, so I, maybe that example was a bad one, but I'm trying to ch tell you that some random thing that happens in life, our flesh might be capable to decide on the wrong thing Preach. and even sin. Yes, that, that That's what we're capable of, and we have no control over it. Uh, it's like at the spur of the moment, um, it's something that we're built in, but we didn't realize until now. Like a great example is my marriage, you know. I thought that I was a nice guy. And then when I married my wife, I realized I wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> you might say, why is that? Because I now, my, uh, I didn't know what my flesh was capable of before. Because I'm so, I don't know my hidden nature. All I knew is the good stuff that I'm good at. But when marriage hit this, suffering hit this, it exposed things in my hidden nature. It came out. If God didn't use that, then the devil would have used some other way to get this ugly thing out of me. All right, maybe that was a better example. But anyway, all right. So uh, what was I going to say? Like I said, this is a hard lesson. I'm trying to get this where we can all understand here. So uh, accidents and faults do happen. So, which is totally unfair, we might say. It's, you're right, nothing's fair in life, though, remember. Why? Go back to step number one. See? So it's just reality. It's called reality. So there are going to be sins that you and I commit that we don't deliberately commit. That we're very nice, honest people, but we still sin. By accident. Now, let me give you a bigger eye-opener here, Okay? Didn't you know that even your perfection is sin? What do I mean by that? Okay. Originally, we were perfect, but after sin, now we're contaminated. 
So what happens with all the works of the flesh? Does God recognize that as, as perfect and you can go to heaven with me? Or he still sees that as not perfect enough? Not perfect enough. Like me to go to heaven. Worse than that, he calls it filthy rags. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. Filthy rags. When he calls it that, that means he sees it as, get this now, sin. That's, that's hard to process, right? Like I told you, this was very emotional, a lot of stuff that I had to go through. But you got to realize, listen, the best that you ever do for God or the best thing, you might be the nicest person in the world, and I thought I was the nicest person in the world, but I got to realize this. Without God, if I put, if I put no God in there, Everything that I do counts for nothing. It's still sin to him. What's a good example of that? A good example is this. Here I am, perfect. In other words, I'm very disciplined, right? So I'm a hard worker. I'm very disciplined. Then what does the devil do with that one? What does, what, what, why is this sin? So this is not fault. This is not accident. This is not deliverance. This is a perfect nature of mine. What happens then is that there's that hidden nature in there of pride, judging others, lack of charity, Come on. even losing your temper, getting angry, and there are perfect people who, it was weird, but there are sometimes people who have no record at all, all of a sudden commit murder. You ever wondered why? Something snapped their perfect world, perfect record, their way of living. Well, your perfect way of living is filthy rags. Amen. Amen. It's capable to become sin. Triple. That's something big, right? Yeah. So then what does that mean? You got to realize this. This lesson should teach you more how much you should humble yourself more. You are really worthless without God. I don't care if you help the old lady across the street or you risk your life to save somebody else's life who's burning in a fire, whose house is on fire. It doesn't matter how noble or great your act is. You and I are really capable of sin and we're wicked, no matter how good of a person you Amen. are. Amen, period. A lot of people don't understand that. How many military soldiers saved people's lives, but then they became terrible fathers, for example, and maybe even beat their children? Well, I was in the military. I did better and... See that? You really underestimate your fleshly nature, don't you? You think the good parts of your nature are good things and please God. What's the point? The point is, you're really worthless without God. So this is not to discourage you, even though this is very discouraging. It is discouraging, see, when you're all by yourself. Do you see that? When you have no God. Do you understand? That is very discouraging. How many, how many churches are trying to build a perfect kingdom. The world's trying to build a perfect kingdom. If everyone is in their best human nature, uh, we'll all live happily ever after. No, everything that you're building can become sin itself. We really underestimate our human nature. It's that wicked and evil. We don't understand how wicked and evil this sin is. Only God knows. And only God can get that out of us and get it changed through suffering. It's very important to understand that. So suffering helps us immensely with that. So perfection is wrong. So here are the consequences then, all right? Now this is what, I was in this process here, okay? And that helped me a lot. Uh, there's a book I would strongly recommend. I don't, some of you read it. It's called The Tale of Three Kings. Uh, written by a different Gene, <laughs> Gene Edwards, okay. But anyway, he wrote a very good book called The Tale of Three Kings. Um, the stuff that I read from there, it, it's, it's not, uh, it, it helped me a lot where I developed this teaching a bit, actually. But I would recommend reading that. But that's a book, great book on hurt, bitterness, and pain, especially by spiritual leaders. It's a really good book. So that, uh, I needed that one. But anyway, um, here are some of the things that happen that uh, the book talked about and that you and I can guess what happened. So if you and I really do our best, let's put this one. This is the best example, okay? You and I are perfect. We do everything perfect, but it turns out to be wrong. 
Do you understand why a Catholic, a sincere Catholic, is offended by your preaching then? Do you understand why a Muslim is offended by your preaching then? Especially if he had his own, uh, it, let's say it's a Muslim terrorist, had his own children blow himself up or die for Allah, and then he finds out that his religion's wrong, his God's wrong, and everything, the best that he did was evil. You know, shake up your world, right? So everything you strived hard to do, sincerity, perfection, you're going to get offended, so bitterness comes out. Pain and hurt comes out. You get angry. Guilt eats you up. You feel worthless that you'll never fix yourself because no matter the best that you do, you still mess up. But we don't realize this. The, it's not the best that you do. This is a part of the process, the best that you do. It's your pride, your fleshly nature. See that? So as a perfectionist myself, this really eats me up, guilt. So I can just, I mean, you can even ask my wife. I just knock off for hours, you know, and then I'm like, in my own world, just praying and talking to the Lord, and I'm like, what did I do wrong? And it hits me really hard, you know? Tears come out, blame. It's easy to blame other people, environmental factors, what you're born with, or even God. And this all gets birthed from unfairness, we have to realize. Where does unfairness come from? Sin. Do we understand how wicked this thing is? It's so awful. It's so awful. That's why the devil wants to make sin light. Do you understand that? With the TV advertisements, what your kids are exposed to? Listen, parents, when your kids get exposed to this at a young age, do you know how much hurt they're going to build up as years pass by? This is very dangerous stuff. This is something that should be dealt, treat with immediately. But this thing becomes very bad. So then, that's why God, he steps in. He tests us. He, when he steps in, he purifies the, uh, these things within our hidden nature, that sins that we didn't know about. And then when he does that, we're now here. And that we committed these actions. It, we tried the best that we could, but it turned out to be wrong. We've uh, done it by accident, by fault. We didn't mean to. Or we've even done it deliberately. A lot of people don't have a problem with this one. But a lot of people have a problem with this one and this one. And that's me. I hated that. And so these consequences came out. But if you... Realize from this lesson that God's just using them to purify you, to get rid of that. Because eventually these monsters were going to come out, right? Especially when you get comfortable, something you're used to, it's harder. Very hard. I'm, you think you're going to see 85-year-old Catholic grandmothers who are so used to worship and marry that they're going to get saved? If that's their whole culture, their used to way of living and... You can't picture that, can you? That's why God has to do it now. He has to shake up our comfortable, used to world now. It's so important because it will become, eventually the monster would come out later on, which will be a point of no return, so to speak. So, if God does that now, then, and if we know from this lesson what we're supposed to do, God's using it. So I got to just what? Simply plead the blood, Yes. See things I need to change and change. When you do that, repentance comes out. Patience. Ugh. <laughs> All right, comes out. Humil uh, love, and this is something that Bible believers really lack. All right, you've heard me teach several lessons on this. But love grows more. How does love grow more? Espe uh, when you get married, you put up with differences. That's a hard thing to do. Bible believers, because we know so much Bible, it's hard to put up with differences. That's why I get very hard on Bible believers, that we do truly lack charity because we're stuck on something that we're convinced in, uh, and they forget Romans 14. 
Romans 14 show people with different spiritual convictions, but don't use that to bash each other. Just leave them be, leave them to the Lord. Think about edifying one another. That's why you'll notice uh, from this pastor, you'll notice how I brought different preachers, right? Different things, and then also strive for unity, emphasize that so much. And the Lord blessed me with a great family. I, I wouldn't change it for the world. But if I was used to a one set of mind family, then our love wouldn't be really proven. So then our cultural backgrounds, our personality differences and age groups, and, you know, I've always told the Lord, Lord, why can't you just give my church families? It'll be easier. People who are from conservative areas, for example, where they can build a bigger church. But the Lord taught me from all this, it increased my love, it increased my wisdom more putting up with differences through charity. And then obviously, humility. You really realize that the best that you do, thank good. Your preaching changes, you know. You thought that, I mean, when you were preaching, you thought you were really preaching. And, you know, you're humble, you don't take pride, but you think those were some good ideas and um, some things you were good at. But then after that, the Lord changes your preaching where he makes you see you're really worthless without him, and that you need him in every aspect when you Amen. preach. It comes out more. A lot of people, when they start out preaching, they start out with not really humility, but false humility. It's more of fear. It's more of they're not confident in Jesus Christ to preach. So that humility is different from this humility. Well, how do I get this humility? You got to go through this school. It's called experience. When you go through this school, then you get there. That's why um, you better be careful, Bible believer, if you can go out like a hot shot and like a hot rod and you go out and you think you got the gifts and you can preach, you can plan a church and stuff like that. That's not how it works. And I speak that as a young preacher too. That's not how it works. All right? I know that especially. I was called at 21. That's very young. That's exceptional. A lot of people don't get called that age. But even I myself had to learn this school, and my suffering did immediately start as soon as I started pastoring. And I thought about quitting many times. I still do, actually. I'm not spiritual, sorry, but I still do. But it's through this process that the Lord has taught me so much and then draw me closer to Him. And most importantly, I was able to make changes. Make changes where I'm spiritually better with Him. And I understand his ways more. And I understand why God doesn't answer my prayer here or there, or why he answers it here and there, and why he doesn't meet my expectation here and there, and why he does. I don't know if that made any sense. Okay? But it basically, it'll draw you a closer understanding with him. I pray that if you have any of this, then uh, it'll be healed, and that you'll get these at the end. Amen. Uh, we understand now, basically... Truly, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. We have to believe in that. We have to believe 2 Corinthians 12. God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. I pray these two verses become more alive to you and you understand that. But there is one question I do want to close and then we'll call it a night, okay? Man, I really like this book. It was really good. They have a, dis they have a discussion, a bunch of questions at the discussion at the end. That one actually helped me. So I knew a lot of Bible, so when I read this, it didn't really help, believe it or not. It gave some good stuff, but it didn't really help because I knew too much, unfortunately. But the discussion question helped. The discussion question, which was very brilliant, what he did was, if you do know a lot, it'll make you think. It'll make you search the answer yourself. So one of the questions that was very helpful to me, he has question number three, and he broke it down to four parts here. Have you been broken? Why do we tend to avoid this? Is it always necessary? Are you willing to live through pain, or do you avoid it? When do you most clearly see the sufficiency of God's grace? That last one hit me. All right. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. It will transform our lives. I know that uh, in my case, Lord, um, 
you worked on me a lot. You worked on me a lot. It really took a toll on me. And it was very hard for me to uh, organize and teach this, but it had to be all taught at once. It had to be all taught at once. I knew that. This was because it's a continual process here that must be all given at once. Thank you for giving me the wisdom, the strength, and the help to sort it all out, to teach it. Um, I pray that it's clear and understandable to the people. They get a footing and I'll help them whatever trial or suffering that they go through in their lives or brokenness that they go through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.